Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. I'm Andy Cahan, Director of Author Events. Our guest, Diane McKinney-Whetstone, is acclaimed for crafting sharply drawn characters and exuberant prose. She is the author of many novels, including Tumbling, Tempest Rising, Trading Dreams at Midnight, and Lazaretto, a historical novel set in a legendary 19th century Philadelphia quarantine hospital. A two-time recipient of the American Library Association Black Caucus Literary Award for Fiction and a winner of the Zora Neale Hurston Society Award, she taught creative writing at the University of Pennsylvania for 12 years and has contributed writing to the Atlantic, Essence, and Philadelphia magazine. In her new novel, Our Gen, Diane follows the residents of a Philadelphia area retirement community who revert to the passions and excesses of their youth. This is her third decade of appearing at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Please welcome back Diane McKinney-Whetstone. Good evening. Thank you all for being here. Andy, thank you for that introduction. And Andy, thank you also for your hand in making the Free Library of Philadelphia through the author series such a highly regarded venue for the exchange of ideas that fosters empathy, intellect, and expanded world. Thank you. Uh, a special shout out to my incredible family, my husband, my children and grandchildren, my sisters, my niece, my nephews, uh, my family members, are my biggest promoters. So if your inbox has been crowded of late with multiple announcements about this event, you can thank my family. <laughs> and I am so grateful for them. Uh, you can also thank them for the refreshments that we'll have uh, at the conclusion of the book talk. So let me tell you about Our Gen. Our Gen is my seventh novel and it's a very different book for me. My previous novel, Lazaretto, was set in the late 1800s on a quarantine facility just outside of Philadelphia. A young black woman has become pregnant by her white employer and gets darker after that. Another novel, Leaving Cecil Street, is set on a tree line block in Philadelphia and tells the story of a teenage girl with promise who's headed to the Ivy League and she becomes pregnant. This is pre-Roe. Her best friend talks her into a backroom abortion uh, with somewhat devastating consequences. Also heavy. Blues Dancing is about two in love college students who become addicted to heroin in the 1970s. They recover and reunite 20 years later setting off the eruption of old desires. Tempest Rising follows three girls of privilege placed in foster care. My first novel, Tumbling, is set in the 1940s and 50s in Philadelphia and tells the story of a family in a community split apart by the city's plans to build an expressway that will run right through their close-knit haven of a neighborhood. A main character suffers from pica and literally eats the walls. As you can see, the themes in all of my books have been heavy. And the journey through each novel is certainly an emotional one for me as an author. And particularly as a black novelist, uh, I tread a dichotomous path where on one hand, the landscape festers with trauma wounds passed down from enslaved ancestors. On the other hand, the landscape blooms with a soy, soulful, joyful, buoyant, inestimable thing called black joy. Our gen then is heavy on the joy. I was working on the revisions for our gen during the pandemic and we were all inside we were masked up with hand sanitizer in short supply. My husband was suddenly home all the time. 
and at least I could joke about that. Not funny though, in fact painful, was having to visit my, my newborn granddaughter across a porch. Thanksgiving, Christmas, birthday celebrations were all canceled. I lost a favorite cousin to COVID and had to say goodbye over FaceTime. I was hearing about people I knew who were losing parents, spouses, siblings, grandchildren, and we couldn't even attend their funerals. Then George Floyd was murdered and the incessant sound of helicopters crowded the air. I craved laughter. I needed to breathe. I discovered that the characters in our gen craved the same thing. So I was revising the story and I took it apart. I allowed the characters to have fun. I allowed them to go for it and go for it they did. They live, these characters live on a posh 55 plus retirement village in the bucolic suburbs of Philadelphia. They get together regularly to line dance to James Brown and sip good wine to John Coltrane and smoke weed. They smoke a lot of weed. I actually had moments during some scenes when I asked myself, can I really write this? I mean, can I write this under my name? Do I need a pen name? And I said, what the heck, I'm writing it. I laughed out loud during portions and I needed that. Now, of course, no conflict, no story. So I look to the characters past. I mean, even as these people are living their best lives, they're also trying to hold their memories at bay. Memories that they believe once fully formed will wreck them. Suddenly the memories seem to spring up everywhere in the Jen's new soft soil. Slowly they awaken to their past and then it gets messy. Much like the writing process itself gets messy for me. I used to abhor the messiness of the writing process. I used to wish that the process was neat and linear, moving from point to point. I mean, just very sequential, like those outlines we learned to craft at Sarah Junior High School, Roman numerals and all. Oh, that's an inside reference. Anybody here from West Philly? <laughs> I could predict, I wish that from the outset, I could predict the story's rising action, the complications, the denouement. I envy novelists who can, and I've actually tried it. But during the writing, something happens and I discover things, important things. And I make connections that I was wholly unaware of at the outset, connections that I could not have made had I followed an outline. So yeah, the writing gets messy and I've come to accept that as part of the process and I'm okay with that at this point in my writing journey because writing imitates life and life sure as heck gets messy. I mean, we were all going about our business in early 2020 and in an instant everything shut down and we were in uncharted territory a pandemic, really? In the early days, the medical community didn't even know how to treat it. So I found the lightness and laughter that I sought as I revised our gin. And then something happened, I found it in real life too. My family and I would have Sunday Zoom sessions that started in the afternoon and went sometimes until 10 o'clock. I mean, we'd cook during the sessions and, and eat as if we were eating together, even though we were looking at each other through a screen. The younger members of the family would pop in for precious minutes, saying they had to, you know, go put the kids to bed, but we knew it because, you know, they didn't want to hang out with us for too long. We talked politics. We talked about what we were reading, watching, streaming. We teased the men about their beards, you know, they were like Dick Gregory's, and uh, the hair that was like Frederick Douglass's, because 
you know, no barbers were cutting. These were a bore of Various no holds barred sessions, similar to the in person get togethers that happened in the novel with the characters in our gen. I mean, except of course for my family, there was, there was no weed. Um, I never know where a story will land once I let it take flight. I've always accepted that I work on it for two, three, four, five of late six years, and I've accepted at the end, when I'm finished, that this is the book I wrote, this is the book I got. But in the case of our gen, it's not only the book I got, it's the one I needed. I would now like to read uh, a little bit from our gen. I'll actually read uh, a, couple of, a couple of sections just to uh, keep it appropriate for a family audience. My grandchildren are here, so. <laughs> and my son is like, Mom, what you consider a family audience, you know, is like back in the 50s. They're more sophisticated, but that's okay. Uh, so I'll read, I'll read uh, from the very beginning, and then I'll set up the next section that I'll read. The cottages at the gen pushed up from the earth like, like new life coming with their one floor open concept designs and skylights where the ceiling should be and walls of windows the better to view the trees through. The trees were everything. None of those pale green saplings typical of new housing complexes here. Here the builders set down mature specimens, still fine though, with voluptuous curvy trunks and jazzy tilts like swagger leans, earned by bending, but not breaking during the storms. The trees gave the development a timeless feel as if they'd always been here and always would be. And timelessness suited the gen's target market who thought themselves like the trees, heirlooms still looking good, still sporting their own curves and swagger, still budding and unfurling and rocking steady, supported by massive roots that they hoped would hide their past, their secrets. The roots tried, but these people had done some things, and all of that wrangling to dig themselves up to move here caused a type of transplant shock. Very recollections of their younger selves took advantage of the weakened roots and broke away. Repressed images wormed through the mantle of the earth and the years, desperate to be seen above ground, just to be acknowledged for having been. Locke opened the glass doors to the clubhouse and took in the air that smelled like wood from the newly laid Brazilian cherry floors and sweetness from the mimosas floating on silver trays. Today was the monthly reception to welcome the newest residents to the gin, and the room was loose with laughter and the buzz of 20 separate conversations rising to join the sway of the grand chandelier. Locke would often turn events like this into a party by showing off his ability at doing the bop and the wobble. And lest someone reduce him to just a black man who could dance, he also liked to engage in conversation and dazzle the folk with how smart he was. He was smart. Considered a genius in the West Philly neighborhood where he'd grown up, Penn Engineering and Sciences, graduate work at MIT, careers at Westinghouse, NASA. But today, he wasn't here to dance or prove his intellect. Today, he was here to find Tish to make up to her for what happened the other night when he and Tish and Tish's next door neighbor, Lavia, gathered at Tisha's cottage the way they'd done on countless evenings. The other night, Locke supplied the weed as usual and they passed the pipe, stuff with healthy buzz, and watched late night reruns on TV One and howled at the clownish attire in Superfly as they marveled at the enduring relevance of the Curtis Mayfield soundtrack. They talked politics and philosophy as the wine went down like silk. Tish and Block broke down the nuances of black consciousness for Lavia, who looked South Asian, but claimed to be from everywhere and nowhere. As they commenced to solve the world's problems, occasionally spouting MF this and that, as if they were 40 years younger and living at the high-rise dorm at Penn. But in the middle of an argument about Hillary versus Bernie, Lavia claimed exhaustion suddenly and left early, left Tish and Block alone. Tish switched the music from Pharaoh Sanders singing about the creator having a master plan 
for a not-so-subtle Marvin Gaye, Began, let's get it on. She swooned toward Block where he sat in the center of her vegan leather couch, pausing to unpin her sister locks that fell around her shoulders like Rapunzel's hair. Block's moment had finally come, and I'll stop at that section right there. And uh, in this section, Block's, um, Block, excuse me, Cynthia's adult son and daughter-in-law have come to help her finish move, moving into the gen. She's moved here reluctantly, and uh, they're, you know, micromanaging her moving and where things should go and how she should program her refrigerator, what to order with her programmable refrigerator and she's had enough, bad enough that they talked her into moving here, and now she has to like listen to them, tell her what to do, and she like in, in no uncertain terms tells them, stop it, leave me alone, and they start to leave, very hurt, uh, and then she calls them back, feeling guilty, and also she has a thing, she doesn't like them to leave when they're angry with her, it's just, you know, she's always been superstitious that way. My mother was like that too. Uh, so, uh, she invites them to the throwback, which is a restaurant uh, on, on the, at the gym. The throwback was alive with sounds. The jukebox pushed out Alicia Keys. Chatter floated from the other booths. The servers chirped the specials for the day. The smoothie maker whirled and buzzed. Forks, tinged plates, the short order cook called out, my man, pots and pans. And Ian and Melanie were back to their effusive selves to Cynthia's relief. They fell into easy conversation with the several people who paused at the booth to welcome Cynthia to the gen. There was Judith, the Dolly Parton lookalike, who invited Cynthia to join her next month at the climate march. Cornelius, the committee person, who asked her to help him canvas for the midterms. Bobby, who used to be Robert, a retired chemistry teacher who now did stand-up and who performed a mini routine at their table about trying to convince herself that the throwbacks vegan milkshakes were the real thing. Then Mays and her husband, Roy, came over to the table. Roy peppered E and Melanie with questions about what they did, where they going to law school, undergrad. Mays interrupted him. Before he asked you about your pre-K experience, we're going to let you guys eat and go get a booth for ourselves. Laughter around until they were out of earshot, and Melanie remarked how engaging everyone seemed to be, especially Mays. I really like May, Cynthia said. We chatted yesterday at the reception. She's a retired public defender. Well, of course she is, Melanie said. I bet she really cared about her clients, too. She exudes empathy. But I'm willing to bet her husband was nobody's public defender, E said. You would be right. He was a judge, Cynthia said, leaning in and whispering. Oh, my God. Such an odd pairing, Melanie said, as she bit into her mushroom and spinach sandwich, leaking pepper jack cheese. Mays in her mismatched feather earrings and flowered child dress and rocking her white girl fro and Roy in his blue blazer and yacht loafers. And his interrogations, he said, as he touched the tip of his napkin against Melanie's chin to wipe away the cheese. You felt it too, right, babe, Melanie said. So he and I talk about this all the time, Mom. How are some white people equipped to ask you what you do before they even ask your name? You know, where are you from? Where'd you go to school? Summer camp, on and on. But we've gotten really good at differentiating those who really want to get to know us and those who mainly want to know how we qualify to be in the same room with them. <laughs> that will be Roy, Cynthia said. I understand that when he moved in, he mistook the only black man who lives here for the porter. Tish had told her that at the reception yesterday as she whispered to Cynthia tidbits about who was who. That's just awful, he said. Wait, a black man lives here, Melanie asked. Yeah, just the one, Cynthia said, trying to sound as nonchalant as she could. Are there many single men here? And what about him? Is he a solo act or living with a she or he or they? Far as I know, just him, but I don't know too far, Cynthia sipped her smoothie. Well, have you met him? What is, what's he like, Melanie asked. Nice enough. I guess too nice for some man to be demanding that he get his bags from his trunk, some white man. The thought of it makes me want to curse. And we know you know how to curse, E said teasingly. Cynthia sensed that E was as eager as she was to turn the conversation from where Melanie was trying to take it. How about mom a little bit ago, Melanie? E laughed as he commenced to imitate Cynthia. Hands off my refrigerator and get the F out of my house. 
I did not tell you to get out, she said, as she settled deeper into the softness of the booth, enjoying their playful back and forth. I have to say, Mom, I haven't heard you use language like that since you were in the hospital, Melanie said. You were having some serious arguments in your dream from that hospital bed. Cursing about who? Who was it, babe? Mr. Z, he said. Right, Mr. Z. Oh, my God, Mom. He was getting upset because you were, like, fighting this Mr. Z in your mostly unconscious state. She rubbed E's back as she talked. But we knew you were coming around when you started settling down, and then no more mention of him. Thank God, E said. I was wondering, who the heck is that guy anyhow? Yeah, who is Mr. Z, Mom? An unhappy baby began to howl, overtaking the throwback's other sounds, the chatter and the laughter and the beats thumping from the jukebox, and E and Melanie repeating Mr. Z over and over again until they were shouting his name, though they weren't really repeating shouting his name. But that's all Cynthia heard as she grabbed for the other sounds, as if the other sounds were crabs along a mountainside that she could use to hoist herself up, to hold on to, to prevent her descent into the rapids below. His name wasn't really Mr. Z. That's the name Gabriella, her best friend, invented for him so they could never have to give breath to his real name so that no one would ever know what happened at night. And now Cynthia had just learned that she said his name out loud to someone other than Gabriella. Even though it wasn't his actual name, it still represented him. And hearing that oral representation of him from E and Melanie paralyzed her for seconds, long enough for E to ask if she was okay. She blamed her reaction on the brain freeze from the smoothie, then said that was her cue that it was time for coffee. She signaled the server so that she could order a cup of half decaf, half regular, and managed to deflect talk with Mr. Z as she asked me, E and Melanie about their plans to sell their condo and buy a house. Now Cynthia was back at her cottage, unzipping garment bags as she pondered what to wear the tissues. She tried to hold at bay any thought of Mr. Z though she knew too well that trying not to think of a thing made that very thing move through her head like a sloth taking its own time. She was in her senior year at Penn and had gone to hear Mr. Z's talk. Gabriella was on mid-semester break from Cheney State College and was spending a few nights in Cynthia's campus apartment and arrived early for the lecture and saved seats, second row center. Cynthia had a clear view to the stage when she pushed toward her seat she glanced up and saw Mr. Z's eyes trained on her. She looked right and left to make sure that she was the one garnering his attention. She was. He confirmed it by tilting his head and smiling. His lips curved like a crescent moon in the daytime. The moon shouldn't be visible when it was light out, but there it was, an unexpected pleasure smiling at her. And now she was seeing the accretion of that smile when he'd shown up in her tiny dorm room in the campus apartment she shared with two other roommates. She was expecting her boyfriend, Macon, the one who lived on her grandmother's block and played love songs on his flute whenever she walked by. Macon had been her steady Eddie safety valve, a reliably tender, present, attentive dream of a boyfriend. But the day before Mr. Z's lecture, Macon had asked for an understanding, which Cynthia knew that he wanted to see other people. So she was trying to be sexy for Macon when Mr. Z showed up. She focused on the conglom conglomeration of options to wear to Tisha's house right now. Tops and pants and dresses piled on her bed. She whittled down her ward wardrobe selection to black. Palazzo pants, high-low top, ballerina flats, crystal necklace, beaded bracelets, drop earrings, pleated clutch purse. She filled in her brows with dark pencil and even used black liner under her eyes, though she knew that would amplify the severity of her eyes. She stepped out into the early evening air where a rising moon made foreplay with the purple sky. There was green all around her from the broad leaf trees. Dusk birds flirted with high notes, gnats circled. A weeping Japanese ma maple, elegant with its bounty of wine-colored feathery leaves, almost hid its branches that twisted and gyrated as if seeking relief from some extreme discomfort. Cynthia pulled her phone from her clutch purse and texted Gabriella. I apparently said his name out loud when I was in the hospital. Ian Melanie asked who he was. She hit send. She knew that Gabriella would know who she was talking about. She sighed into the twilight and her breath scattered the gnats and Tisha's house came into view. So I think I'll stop there. 
Diane, I was in James's group, yes. the Rittenhouse Writers, yes. with you when yes. you first attempted fiction. Yes. You were getting up at five in the morning. Yes. Writing before you went to work. Yes. And managing your family life. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you could tell us something about how you managed it and where the drive came from to carry you through not one, but seven novels. Thank you. Thank you for that question. I, 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 I wanted to write fiction. I knew I wanted to write. I wrote for my day job. I was working for the USDA Forest Service, and we took the science, the res it was a research station, so we took the science um, the Forest Service Sciences, it made it palatable for, for lay audiences. And, and it got to the point where I was writing news releases, say about uh, plant death on, in, in North Carolina, that I mean, I thought was um, from air pollution, but the Forest Service said it was from this little bug, this bossy wooden adult. Why I still remember that, I don't know. That was actually killing the trees. So I was charged with putting the information out that it's a bug uh, not air pollution is actually killing these trees in North Carolina. And I, um, I remember I wrote the news release, the butler didn't do it. And I proceeded to tell a story. I mean, a real, it was, it was a real mystery. I mean, using the facts, of course, but I was, and I realized, ah, oh, I need to be writing fiction. I mean, I just, I need to be writing fiction. So that started me on the journey. I mean, it, it just became this internal thunder that I, I really always thought that I would write fiction at some point in my life, and I wasn't doing it. And I could no longer ignore the impulse. And my excuse was I didn't have time. And I would hear the voice, you know, you make time. The only time of day I owned was very early in the morning that I didn't have to negotiate with family or job or community or anything else. That became my time. And so I, I would get up sometimes 4.30, 5 o'clock and write. And it initially it fit very neatly in that time span. But after that, uh, it, got, it got, as I talked about, it got messy. And I would look up and it was, you know, eight o'clock and the children were late for school. My husband was late for work. It's because I was the family's alarm clock. And, but the messiness needed to happen both in my life and on the page for me to get through to the first novel. And so I still have that impulse to write. It, it hasn't gone away. Even though I presumably have more time now, my time is still very early in the morning. I mean, that's when things happen for me. You know, I, I, I sense connections. You know, I feel wiser, I feel smarter, I just feel more spiritually connected very early in the morning. There's something about the transition between night and day uh, that is really affecting for me. And so uh, that impulse is still there, and uh, it's carried me through, uh, through seven novels. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hi, Diane. I remember you saying once that um, it was difficult for you to write in the present because um, it's hard to like fictionalize brand names and social media and you know all the things that are going on in the present now. And I noticed that with most of your novels haven't been written in the present time. And it sounds like just from the scene that you wrote that this one takes us back into memory, mm -hmm. um, even though it is set in the present. Um, do you still feel that way about when you're writing? And, and is memory a big part of this book? It, it is. Thank you for that question, Annette. It's good to see you. I, I actually, I, I prefer to write in the past. I'm just pulled to the past. And initially, this novel was going to be set in, it was going to be entirely contemporary. That was my thought, my design, uh, which you know quickly goes out of the window as I get into the writing. Because then I'm just, I'm, I have to add, like, where did these people come from? How did they grow up? What did they experience growing up? Uh, what made them the people uh, that they turned out to be? And 
I'm just constantly drawn to the past, and I, I, I realize now that that's just, you know, that's kind of how we live. I mean, we're living today. Um, our mind is five minutes ago. Our mind is five years ago. It's back to today. And so I think in some ways that structure kind of uh, approximates real life for me. It's, it's easier for me to use my imagination in the past because I'm not looking around and seeing things. Uh, I noticed when I was writing the, the um, like the contemporary scenes, it's easy, to, you know, I can be lazy. I can just, this is what's going on and, and kind of chronicle that. Uh, when I'm writing in the past, I have to work harder to figure things out and to see things as, as perhaps they were or as perhaps my imagination tells me that they were. And actually, a lot of times when I check the facts, my imagination has come pretty close, which always amazes me when that happens. But um, I'm, I, just, I just feel a pull to the past, and I feel more creative when I'm writing in the past as opposed to the current day. So maybe I will be able to pull off a novel that is uh, entirely contemporary. So far, I have not managed to do it. Mm -hmm. Hi, Diane. Hi. First of all, I love you. I've read all of your books. Um, and to the young lady's point behind me, did, did your grandmother or anyone influence any of your previous books that like took place in the 40s and like did you have any family influences because while it was fiction it seemed so real mm -hmm. and so like you were reflecting on you know it just seemed so reflective sure. and just so real did anyone sure. influence you yeah I family? actually when, I, when I'm writing in the past I often I'll hear my grandmother's voice and the way she phrased things and I'll use that and when I was working on Tumbly my father was still alive and he you know, was able to tell me like what was on what corner and just was really helpful just in, in um, helping me to evoke just the atmosphere of that time. And then I'd grown up with my mother's stories about that neighborhood. And so, uh, I mean, she just, it was downtown and it was to her like this wonderful place and it's, well, if it was so wonderful, why did you move? And well, they were gonna build a road. And so I think that always stuck with me and I actually fictionalized that uh, in tumbling or exploited that notion in tumbling. Uh, my, my oldest sister was also still alive and so she, she told me a lot about the music and the clubs and um, so that yes, I had, I had people who I could actually talk to for the writing of tumbling, which was incredibly helpful. And then I also came to the library. This is like back in the day when you know, you had to do like microfilm and it was, you know, I assigned my children to, okay, you do wardrobe, you do sports, like tell me what was going on in the 40s and 50s. And, um, but it was, it, was, it was also exciting just working on, working on the novel because I learned as much as I, I um, I'm not a fan of research, I prefer to imagine uh, the, the research. I mean, I, I learn things that, that I can then incorporate. So yeah, my, uh, uh, my older family members were incredibly helpful for that first novel. Hi, Diane. I love all your novels, and I love um, um, Our Gen because I feel like it's talking about something I need to do, or maybe I need to <laughs> move to a 55 plus community. No, you are way too young, yeah. <laughs> no, um, I'm a candidate. Okay. okay. okay, okay. <laughs> but thank you. Uh -huh. But I love your novels, and typically it seems like you focused on a 20-year-old, 30-year-old. Why the 55 plus? Because I feel like that's a, that's a kind of ignored generation. And it's almost as if, uh, I mean, in this, this our society is youth obsessed, right? I mean, I recognize that. And, and I'm okay with, it's now, I mean, it's, it's the younger generation's turn. I'm okay with letting them have the turn and and do everything that, that needs to be done, you know, to help me at this point in my life. I am entirely okay with that. But on the other hand, it's as if when you reach a certain age, like that's it, it's over. And so I wanted to write about these people who are like still enjoying themselves. You know, like they still have relationship problems. I mean, the, the things they go through, like something, I could have gone through at 21, but they're still going through that, and it's, it's real. It feels real. 
when I was working on the, uh, when they were working on the cover, you know, and they um, contracted with a young artist, very talented to do the cover, and, and the initial sketches were, no, they look old. <laughs> and I mean, she's, you know, not 30 yet, so it, old is, is different to her. Old is probably me. And, and I, I mean, I even asked my son, look at this. He said, well, I said, but don't they look old? He said, well, they look age appropriate. I said, do I look like that? Well, I mean, some of your peers, your age, maybe. I mean, they, they weren't, younger people I showed it to were not affected. I mean, it just, it seemed normal to them. My sisters, on the other hand, my one sister has said, oh, no, 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 no. So, so I realized that, you know, after a certain age, you know, people just have this picture of what, uh, what a person is and should be. And I just wanted to explore these people who are just like living their best lives and, and having fun. Mm -hmm. Diane, would you talk a bit how the, about how the characters took on a life of their own and surprised you and how maybe you had to corral some of their impulses yeah that that happens in every book and I'm always I'm always amazed when it happens but now I welcome it uh, I mean in my first novel it was very frightening because I'd, I'd not written before and I didn't understand how important that part of the process is to leave room for discovery and um, it was as two characters were saying to me you know if you put us on the same page we're going to get together and it was like no you can't it's gonna mess up the book but I realized that I had to, I had to yield to that. Um, so in, in this book, the, you know, the characters are, they're kind of all over the place. And when I went back into their past, uh, to that I saw how it informed what they're like today. And uh, there was one character in particular who um, I had to rein in over and over because it's like, no, if, if I like, if she really lets go, I can't write this under my name. I mean, it will just be, no, I cannot. My editor will be Diane. <laughs> no, this is too different. So, um, and that surprises me when that happens. But the fact that it does happen then, at least gives me a, a larger sense of, of who this character is and, and what this, what, you know, what moves this character. And so then knowing that I can uh, write about the character and be still be true to the character's nature, uh, even if I do uh, have to rein her or him in from time to time. But it's very they they surprise me. Yes. Mm -hmm. Do you ever get get almost scared of what you're writing? That's not me. I can't do that. Nobody will accept that. I I have and and I I. There's a part of me that believes that it's important to be scared a little bit and to go there uh, because that's where, that's where the strongest writing is. And sometimes it's just that it's so honest that that's why it's scary. And it's like, no, I can't do that. And it's, but that is, is where I need to do. So I'll, I'll do it in, in small bursts, you know, a sentence here, a sentence there until I am comfortable with it, but that that definitely happens. And I used to tell my students that if something, you know, if something feels threatening, like don't back off. Like that's where you want to go. I mean, it should, some parts should feel a little threatening and things will happen on the page at that point. Hi, it's so good to see you up there tonight. Hi. Um, really enjoyed your reading and also your introductory remarks. Um, a number of African-American authors talk about this idea of the white gaze. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, as you're developing stories, as you're developing characters, you talked a little bit about, like, if I let these characters go, I may not be able to write under my own name. I'm wondering how, if at all, are you impacted or is your writing impacted by that notion of, of the white gaze, and if, if so, how and, 
and how do you navigate that as you're thinking about who this story is going to be potentially mm -hmm. for? Mm -hmm. That that's actually a good question because I write initially for myself. I mean, I write a story that I want to read, and I write a story that satisfies me. And uh, so, initially, that is, you know, it's 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 me, and that's who I need to satisfy, and that's who I am writing for. By the time it gets to my editor, then it's also, uh, well. He should be satisfied. I, I hope he loves it. Um, and even before then, when it, when it gets to my agent, and I hope she loves it because if she doesn't love it, she's not going to be able to sell it. Uh, the white gaze, you know, I've heard a lot about. I honestly don't think that it affects me much. Um, I'm more concerned with, like, you know, my grandmother's gaze. You know, like the ancestors' gaze. I mean, that's, that is, I think, the gaze that affects me more. And um, so, no, I'm not, I mean, I don't feel at all stifled by that. I mean, I feel, you know, if I can satisfy myself uh, that, that I've, I've already met a, a certain bar, if I'm satisfied with the material and uh, then beyond that, I think I work really hard to particularize the characters uh, because I am white writing about black people. And so if I am making them very particular, uh, I don't have to worry about lapsing into stereotype uh, because then it's, you know, like the paradox happens, the more particular, the more universal. And so then they can be seen as not, you know, in one novel, I struggled with where the man is addicted to heroin, like, oh, well, black people, I mean, this is before the current opioid epidemic that's, you know, caught up more white people, actually, um, that, oh, this is how, you know, black people are. Um, I didn't worry about that because I was particularizing this character so much uh, that he had humanity, and so I worked really, really hard at that so that the characters don't lapse into type. Um, so no, I, I, don't, I don't feel at all stifled by the white gaze. I mean, if anything, it's again like, what would my grandmother think, you know, if she were alive? And, you know, I feel her looking down on me, so yes. Mm -hmm. Hi. Hi. It's not necessarily a question. I just want to thank you. Uh, I've read all of your books, mainly because when I read the first one, I felt seen. And I think it's important for you to know that. I work with seniors, mm -hmm. and there's certain things that you said, in fact, I you know, share your, the whole bit. The ma'am, you know, is at a certain age, people don't see you. All of a sudden, I'm not, you, they look around and say, when did I become a ma'am? Mm -hmm. I don't know how it is for men, <laughs> but you know what I mean? And it's like, you know, you still wear the skirt and you dye the hair and get all of the things done. <laughs> but you're still the ma'am. So I'm, I'm so looking forward to your book because I think it's important for people to recognize, like you said, you still have a life, you still have uh, meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. So thank you very mm -hmm. much. Thank you. Um, I might have missed it, but where does your book, this book, take place, the gin? Um, it, it actually takes place on a 55 plus active living retirement village that's you know in an unnamed place in the bucolic suburbs of Philadelphia. Oh, it is uh, but the past though do go back to they go back to Philly very much the the um, you know the clatter of, of West Philly streets are, are very present you can in, hear it, huh? in this novel. Yes okay. indeed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we'll end right here in on the second row. This is not a question, it's more of a comment mm -hmm. and saying thank you. Because for a while I did live in Philadelphia. And when I read your books, I saw myself walking down those streets. Mm -hmm. And it took away the homesickness mm -hmm. that I would get from time to time. So thank you very much. Oh, that's very nice, thank you. Very sweet. Oh, my goodness. Thank you. Thank you. Can somebody 
we'll take a picture. That's the best way to end a program. Please join me in thanking Diane Kinney-Whetstone and her granddaughters.